Well, welcome back. I hope you completed everything you needed to do to be 100% present. Our speaker this morning, Daniel Miller, was born a type A personality, driven through school in his uh, graduating magna cum laude, the top of his class in law school, a successful real estate investor, making just a truckload of money in his 30s. Just, I mean, a whole lot. Living up in Bel Air and uh, you know, that became a lifestyle, but uh, apparently, he, he, I mean, I'm just reading this, I'm just meeting him today, but he found that to be an empty existence and through a, but that in and of itself isn't enough to cause a change. <laughs> so through a, a period of setbacks, he uh, was on a mission to redefine himself. And uh, what he has discovered is that through losing control and letting go of the reins just a little bit, little bit, maybe more, uh, that uh, there's a, a quality of life that far surpasses anything he had achieved before. And to tell you more about it, please welcome Daniel Miller. Thank you, and thank you, Gaddy. Uh, can I take you on the road with me? Yeah? It'd be just a great opening act. I want to first of all acknowledge and thank the members of, of Inside Edge for making myself and my guests feel so comfortable and invited. It's very much appreciated. And I also want to thank Adrian for arranging for things to go so smoothly. Thank you. Have you ever had a friend, that, a really dear friend that, that, you, that you love, but he just drives you nuts, you know, with the idiosyncrasies? I had a friend, in fact, I've had more than one friend like that, but one friend in particular was a very, his name was Ethan. He was a really close, dear friend. He took me in and he took me into his place after I separated from, from my first wife. He was a person that was always there for, for me, but he had this one idiosyncrasy that was just driving me mad, is I could never get in touch with him. He did not have an answering machine. And you know, in those days, everybody at least had answering machines. And one day I remember, uh, I was always harping at him, is, you know, get an answering machine so I can leave a message if I have to get a hold of you for something. And he, he just never would. And then one day he said, well, Danny, you know, you can always get a hold of me. Just call me at the office. And that just set me off. I mean, when he said that, it was like, you know, and I just really let him have it. Ethan didn't talk to me for three years after that. Three years, three years. I'm, I'm assume most of you have children, but... Have you ever been so concerned and worried about your children <clears throat> that you, you're always trying to help them and advise them and, and do things for them? Uh, I did that with my young son, Brandon, um, probably 30 years ago. Uh, I was, of course, a big controller. I was always advising Brandon what he should do, how he should do it. You know, and as a young kid, he, was, he accepted that. He had no choice. But as he got into his teenage years... He started resisting, and he became, you know, very dismissive of me. In fact, he wouldn't even listen to me. And, and, you know, for a controller not to have someone listen to you, it's one of the worst things that can happen to you. But that's what happened. That's what happened. And so what I'm here today to hopefully share and, and talk about is I have come to learn that it, it's, it's not necessary that we create these conflicts and harm these close bonds in our lives. And it's not necessary that we lose intimacy with people. And the way, and I write about it and I'm talking about it, the key way of doing that is to let go of control and accept life as it is. Let go of control and accept life as it is. And when you do, new horizons will come your way. I think what you will see, the, the blinders are removed. And you will see the opportunities that are there that you wouldn't otherwise recognize. And you'll be able to make choices that can really improve your lives significantly. On the back cover of my book, there's a question that says, what would your life be like if you simply let go of control? Well, 30 years ago, I never even thought of that. As controllers, first of all, most of us aren't aware of how controlling we are or the harm that we cause to ourselves and others. 
And as a result, I was just a massive compulsive controller. I tried to control everyone and everything in my life. And I was really good at it. <laughs> really good at it. At home, as father knows best, I felt I knew what was right for everyone. At work, I hovered over people. Things had to be done my way. I didn't listen very, very much to other possibilities and other options from people. And in many ways, as Gabby's mentioned, I was successful. On an external basis, I was successful. Lived in Old Bel Air. I taught at UCLA. Uh, I had people, celebrities and other people, wealthy people, entrusting large sums of money to me to invest on their behalf. I wrote a book on real estate investments. So it's true, I was externally successful, but I didn't feel it inside. I didn't feel it inside. I had no core sense of well-being. I mean, how could I? You know, controllers, it's always the what ifs and what could be's and what might happen. And when you're that way, you're, you're really fear dominated. And I would still, I'm sure, be following that same path had it not been for a series of traumatic events that felt like they assaulted me. I remember having uh, dinner with, with my wife at the time in our home, and the garage was right outside uh, uh, the kitchen, and I heard this whipping noise. It sounded just like a wild animal just whipping around. And I opened the door and I went out, and I just saw flames coming out. And I couldn't figure out what is going on here. And I realized that there, there's a fire in my garage next to my car. And so I ran, and I, I got the hose, and I, I doused it out. I, as I put the water in, it kept flaming up more. And fortunately, I put it out because right above that garage was my son Brandon's bedroom. It was a near catastrophe was barely averted. And there were a series, and by the way, there was this weird neighbor that we had ongoing battles with that carried machetes on our property. So, I mean, I sort of knew who it was. But there was this series of other things, and I, I talk about them in books. I'm not going to speak too much of them about it now, but it was near bankruptcy. Uh, one of my properties burned down. Another property, there was a murder, shootout, death. Um, I had an ongoing legal battle with, with a very strong, uh, powerful person. And, and it was just ongoing. These series of what most people would call wake-up calls didn't wake me up. Didn't wake me up. <laughs> I was always controlling. And if you know the type, and if you're the type, you know probably what I'm talking about. And I was younger then. I had energy and I had strength, you know, so I could, I could keep going. And then the final wake-up call was a wake-up call. I remember awakening from what felt like a dreamlike state. And I saw white, bright white lights above me and white rooms and there was a smell, it was a sort of a sterile smell. And as my vision came clearer, I saw there were a group of people, and I was laying on a bed. And a voice came to me, and he says, Danny, we need your written permission and consent before we can go further. And I realized, it came to me, oh, this is Dr. Kirianov. I had gone into their hospital earlier for a simple 20-minute procedure. I had skin cancer right here, basal, right on my right side of the nose. But as a controller, I had missed prior appointments. And what happened, I was under for five hours. It was unconclusive, and he needed my permission to go further. There was a series of probably five other major surgeries where I lost the right side of my nose, and it was reconstructed over a two-year period. And I was out of work for three months. But this wake-up call was my wake-up call. I didn't have the strength or the wherewithal to go on fighting the latest demons had come my way and the latest challenges. So I surrendered. I surrendered. I had no choice. I had no choice at that time to surrender. And that was so unlike me, but I was beaten. I was beaten and I knew it. And what evolved, what evolved was something really amazing when I think back even to this day. And it is the change in my life starting then. I had a glimpse of another way of living. When I returned to work three months later, everything was going pretty well without all my help. You know, Danny, why don't you go get, have some coffee, the secretary would say. You know, I, 
I realized that I wasn't as important as I thought I was. My input wasn't as necessary as I thought it was. And so what evolved was, is what I call a holistic way of doing business, and I write about it in the book about letting go of control at work, in which you try to go with the ebbs and the flows of the workplace, and you're not, I don't persist, and I don't insist, and I don't res resist as much. And what I try to do is act and engage more intuitively with the circumstances as they're evolving, so that my input is at a more appropriate input. And as a result, what happens is you go down fewer blind alleys and paths, fewer diversions. I had a clarity where I could focus on what was truly relevant and deal with what was truly relevant. And over time, I was working less than half of what I was before and, and making more. And so I had all this, this extra time and energy to start pursuing my passions. I started painting. I started painting. I couldn't draw as a kid. I started painting, and within a year, I was coming out with some oil paintings that I couldn't even believe I was doing. I really couldn't. I got accolades and acknowledgments. It was like, am I doing this? And they're on my website. I invite you to view them. You know, it's at www, losing control, finding serenity. <laughs> I'm proud of these paintings. I had time, I started writing and composing some poems that got published. I had time to go back to playing tennis, which was my youth passion. And within a couple of years, I was actually winning some seniors tournaments. I had time to devote to my family, real, real time to devote to my family. I was able to write a book. This, this took over 20 years to do it, but I did it. And at home, I started to listen more without advising, with, without suge even suggesting a lot of times. And the interesting thing happened, you know, Brand Brandon, who was dismissive of me, as he became a young adult, I had by that time stopped advising, is he would come up and say, Papa, I have this problem at work. Can you help me with it? Or something, something important in his life. And that was really amazing because I, I had already backed off and he was now coming to me. And I have found with my children, I have two daughters in addition to Brandon, that it, it just it works amazingly well when you can be there to su support them, to encourage them, but to not always be advising them. Let them evolve, let them bloom, let them develop in their own way. What I hope today is to share with you some deep control tools and processes so that you will not have to have the wake-up calls in your life or any more wake-up calls if you've already had them. And maybe you can share with the younger people in your families so that they won't have to have these strong wake-up calls before you can let go of control and accept life as it is, and enjoy, and enjoy the freedom and contentment that that brings. So I'd like to now share a few very important ways that I've learned, I write about, and like to share with you the key ones. You know, I just, it just occurred to me, that, however, that most of you may not be controllers, <laughs> right? Are there a lot of non-controllers? I bet there are some. Well let, me ask, well, let me ask all of you a few questions. Do you, believe, do you believe that helping your mate clear her clutter in her office or bedroom is going to result in her keeping a neater room? Do you? do you? Do you believe that harping at your husband or wife for drinking too much or eating too much is going to result in their eating or drinking less? Do you believe that advising your, your children how they should run their business is that they're going to follow your advice? Or do you believe that t not letting your, your children listen to rock music while they're doing homework is going to result in their getting better grades? Or how about, do you believe if you suggest something more than once or give your opinion more than once, there's a greater chance it's going to be followed? 
Now, if any of you answered yes to any of those questions, you need to buy my book. <laughs> and even if you haven't, you need to buy it to help you with the controllers in your life. So I, I hope that what I'm going to talk about that you can take in and, and accept and, and apply as you like in your life. So the control tools. One of the most significant ones is what I call embracing our personal truths, to be able to embrace our personal truths. Now, by personal truths, I mean those, those unwanted feelings, those sort of what we call negative feelings, fear being the foremost, anger, resentment, our insecurities, our anxieties, our rejections. What happens is when we don't address those and we don't process them, they stay within us, and then they fester. They fester and they build up until they come out. They come oftentimes exploding in control actions, sometimes even in rage. So the main one of these unwanted feelings is, is fear, is fear. Fear is the primary catalyst of controlling conduct, so definitely. And it's one of the most difficult things I think we have to deal with is our fears. So how can we do that? One way, or the way really, is we need to be able to separate the objective facts, the objective reality, from the nightmares that are fear script for us. And they're often widely separated. But our imagination really goes to these, these, these nightmares. But m once we can do that separation and what we can see is the objective reality, we can start to deal with that reality. And even partially dealing with it will result in diffusing our fear significantly. And there are different ways of doing it. And they really relate to having a proper perspective. And one way is what I call a worst case scenario exercise. This was taught to me by Dr. William Duff probably 30 years ago. I was in the travails of having owed the bank huge amounts of money and the bank suddenly called my loans. And I was having these nightmares where people were chasing me in the middle of the night and everything else. And it, they were just ongoing. So one day he took me through this session and, and he said, Danny, what's the worst thing that might happen if you don't pay your bank loans? Well, my credit be, will be shot and the bank's going to sue me. And what then, Dr. Duff said? Well, they're going to get a... They're going to get a judgment against me, and they're going to, they're going to attach my assets. Yes. Well, if, if they do that, I'm going to have to file bankruptcy. Okay. Well, if I file bankruptcy, I'll, I'll be out of work. I, I won't have anything to do. Yes, Dr. Duff said. I have nothing to do, but I just have to lie on the beach all day. And this is true. And as I said that, it was like, wow, wow, this is the, this is the worst thing that's going to happen to me? That gave me the clarity and the perspective that I needed to address the issues that had hand. The bank had called my loans. I needed to pay them. The next month, I was able to get another bank to loan me enough money to pay the first one. I could not have done that had I gone down this path of total fear. In fact, I feel it's so important that in the get some water. In the in the writing of the book, as I was writing, I was also writing poems. Thank you. And fear, as you can probably already tell, was was a major thing in my life, and I think most people's lives, and also significant regarding the control, I wrote a poem titled Fiction's Bestseller that I would like, like to read to you. Because it, it encapsulates and evokes what I'm trying to say about how we deal with our fears. A master of disguise with tentacles so long Flourishing like wild mint in the tepid soil of our minds. With us unbeknownst, 
It's heavy silence so loud. It feeds our anxiety, but nourishes only our doubts. Deceit's best lover, so blindfold brave, sharks our dreams, tons our creativity. Yet, truly a coward until masked. Stare at stare, deflect its glare, strip it bare. Reveal this thing, fear for what it truly is, a wimp, a wimp. Hiding in our frail armor, parading as fiction's bestseller. That really says what I'm really trying to say. You can probably read my poem, but don't have to buy my book. (laughs) At least it's to fear. Another significant decontrol tool is accepting people as they are. Accepting people as they are. And I know many of you, if not most of you, know that already. When we don't accept people as they are and and we try to change them or to control them, it does several things. First of all, it creates dissension, a lot of dissension. Who likes being told what to do or, or, or that they're not good enough? And the other thing it does is we are focusing on others, and when we're doing that, we can't focus on ourselves. And that's where the true growth comes, I've found, is when I'm able to really focus on my shortcomings, my responses, my reactions, what I can do to do things better in my life. This comes when we start accepting people as they are. You know, Ethan, uh, I told you earlier, well, three years later, we started speaking again because we had mutual friends and, 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 and common gatherings. But what happened was quite interesting is, first of all, I learned to accept his qualities and his positive traits. And the parts that, I, that bothered me, I, I reflected and I said, well, what can I do about it? And it was real simple. It was real simple. I didn't have to make the type of plans that would require my having to get a hold of him and leave a message. That was it. It was really that simple. And so I started doing that. Now, we start seeing each other much, much less frequently. But when we did, we enjoyed ourselves so much more. And our bond today, he's one, he's one of my best friends. And a little footnote to this thing is when we did renew our relationship, Ethan had a cell phone. (laughs) He had a cell phone. We wouldn't have an answering machine, but he had a cell phone. That wasn't by my doing by any means. He chose to do that. So we need to accept people as they are. Um, The other thing that it does, it really brings us intimacy and closer bonds with people, particularly, our, particularly our, our loved ones. I like to say that, you know, control pushes intimacy away and acceptance brings it in. And a story I'd like to tell is about uh, Anna and Saguta. Now, Anna came over from the old country after World War II to Chicago, raised five children, in a house that had one bathroom. But yet, Anna was not a nurturing mom. She wasn't, didn't have the time or the energy, but that just wasn't her, in her nature. And, and quite a few years later, when Saguta moved out to California, when Saguta would reach out to her mom, she was always desiring that acknowledgement, that connection, that nurturing mother, but she never got it. In fact, what she got was really something else. Her mother would make these comments that would just totally undermine her, you know. So the more she was trying to, in a way, pressure her mother, because her mother felt the pressure, the more it came back. And so she was doing that for quite a long time. And then one day she was, uh, she watched that film of Jodie Foster. I forget the name of it, but Jodie's character was raped in this movie. And the very first thing, the very first thing that Jody did was to call her mother. And when Saguta saw this, she had this epiphany. She realized 
my mother was the very last person I would call, the very last person. And then it, that moment of clarity, Saguta started accepting her mother as she was. She started trying to seek what her mother was unable to give her. And what evolved with this very mature, almost friend-to-friend, woman-to-woman relationship. And then years later, when her mother was dying with a very severe illness, Saguta went to spend the last two weeks of her mother's life with her in Chicago. And what happened was this amazing intimate bond. Saguta planned her mother's funeral with her. She helped select the clothes that she was going to wear. She helped select the amber jewelry from Lithuania that she was going to wear, even the earrings and even the prayer songs that would be sang. So this amazingly intimate bond evolved And I think it's because both women accepted each other for who they were and weren't asking anything of each other. And I'm a part of this story and know it so well because Saguta is my wife. I saw it all. I saw it all. So intimacy, intimacy, and I think we all want that. Controllers want intimacy. I think we want connection. You need to let go of control. You need to let go of control. Another de-control tool is to moderate our expectations. Moderate our expectations. When we have too high of expectations, it fuels controlling actions. We try to do too much to attain those high expectations, whether it's of others or of ourselves. So we need to be realistic about our expectations. Many of you, if you're in the arts, and I know you are because I've heard some of your stories, creativity flourishes with letting go. It closes down with control. I know that as a painter, an artist, as a writer. And so moderate. Our, I, I've had paintings that started out so great. It's like, wow. And then I had these high expectations, and they just, that was it. It was over. I couldn't, you know, didn't go further. I didn't appreciate what I, what I had. And so what I've learned to do, just real, real briefly is not to overanalyze them, not to overthink them, not to have such high expectations, expectations. Enjoy the process, the creative process of what you're doing. Enjoy it. So expectations in all parts of our lives. Let me tell you another story about my, my daughter, Laura, who's graduating from USC actually next week. When she was about 12 or 13, she was playing tennis in middle school. I started playing tennis. And we enjoyed playing with each other a lot. We had a nice little bond to develop. Well, I, you know, the controller that I was and the high expectations. And as a dad, I wanted her to get better. And Laura, take a lesson. Laura, take some clinics. You know, I was really pushing her. I wanted her to try to get on the high school team when she got into high school. And daddy, daddy, it, uh, you know, I, I don't want to take this. It's too competitive. It's too competitive. Oh, come on, Laura. You, you could do it and do it. And, and I was just that way. And, and then one day... And one day, it was tears. I saw tears coming down her eyes. It was, Daddy, I, I don't want to play tennis anymore. I mean, really. And when that happened, oh, my goodness, when that happened, I was so pained. And I just knew immediately what I had done. You know, my expectations, she's, she's my dove. You know, she's half Native American. She has this calmness. And she just enjoyed tennis because it was fun. And she enjoyed tennis because she played with, when we played together. I backed off, obviously. But what happened was interesting. I took up tennis again. That's when I took it up about seven years ago. I joined a tennis club. I started playing. I started improving. And I started winning some tournaments. I, you know, that would have not have happened. 
The other interesting thing is a couple years later, she went out and made the high school team on her own. So it's amazing what happens when we can moderate our expectations and accept life as it is and start to, start to let things go. Just to trust, to trust that we're going to be able to take care of ourselves. Trust, in, really, in a way, in, 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 in the goodness and the, in the joy and, and the wonders of life. And letting go of control is the way that I have found that brings me that. So I, I thought perhaps it might be a good time if it, now if any of you have any, any questions, I'd be, be happy to respond to, and then I just have a, a few closing words after that. Gaddy. Oh, I was just wondering if you can take just a minute, because like any good idea, it can be misused. And uh, you know, I find myself wrestling with the difference between letting go of control and abdicating responsibility. Okay. That's, that, Gaddy, that's, that's an excellent question. I'm glad you asked it. What I mean by letting go of control, that doesn't mean being lazy, fair, laid back, you know. Yeah, I'm talking about yeah, you. Doesn't, that's not what I mean. I'm, that's why I'm glad you raised it. What it means is, is being a little patient, right? A L- little patient and waiting for the circumstances that feel right where you can use your intuitiveness and trust yourself to, to then act. What I have found when I let go of control, I'm more aware, I am more alert, and I take care of things fine. I just don't waste a lot of extra emotion doing things before it's, it's time to do those things. So, and the other thing I want to say, <clears throat> I'm talking about the type of control, like we say, for lack of better, bad control, good control. You know, <clears throat> we naturally need to have control in our lives. We are a nation of laws. Uh, Science, medicine, there, there definitely have to be strict uh, types of control, and, and I'm not suggesting that's not. The type of control that I'm suggesting that harms us is the type that's triggered by these strong emotions, like I said, the fear and the anxiety and, and, and things like that. More often than not, those types of control are harmful to us. <clears throat> sure. Sure. Let's see. I want to ask you about sports and uh, zero-sum games and uh, winning. You know, so, uh, yeah, and I know you mentioned Kobe Bryant in your book a bit. Uh, so, you know, what, can you, again, uh, say more about the fine points of letting go when you're in the middle of a basketball game where your goal is to win and have the other team lose? Okay. Um, I don't know, last, last couple of years, you know, you see when, Go, uh, when Kobe tries to take over a game too much, what happens? He starts missing shots in his last series. The ball was stolen from him. You know, what, what I found, and, and I relate it more to tennis, is when I try to do too much, what it, what it does, it, it can not, not only, you know, even the most talented players can throw my game off, but my teammates, it takes them out of their game. And I think that's quite honestly what happens to the Lakers quite, quite often. In tennis... You know, when I'm playing doubles, what I found is like when my, when my partner is starting to mess up, I, I, in the past I had this tendency that I feel I have to pick it up and, and, and take, cover more of the court and do more of the things, and meaning to get too controlling. And then what happens is I start messing up. So what I, I guess is, is I, I trust that to stay within my own game and within my own skills and, and, and not to, to overextend. I also go through, quite honestly, a visualization process before a match in which I envision, you know, rhythmic movements, you know, just even before I'm out on the court. So I try to visualize this process of what I'm going to do be- before I get out there. And, and I, there's, I think also in the, uh, in, in the, uh, the book I may have talked about baseball, but it's almost, almost every sport where you'll... You, uh, you'll hear some player quoted, well, I was trying too hard. I took too much batting practice. You know, my father, this is true, he hits too many buckets of, of golf balls, you know. And you, you can get to the point where you need to know your, your limits and when, you, when you're pushing it. And that's, that's all I'm, I'm trying to say. And, I, and I, use, I express that in terms of, you know, it is letting go. It is sort of letting go of, of, of trying to do too much. question that was personal about letting go of expectations, which I would still like to ask, but I wanted to tell you about 
a YouTube thing that's going around on Facebook and so on about a high school and a and a, a 16 year old autistic kid who's the, the the manager of the basketball team, and everybody loves him because he's so out there and such a fan. Last game of the season, the coach in the last three minutes of the game put this kid in as a player. And everybody cheered because it was really exciting. And his first two balls that he threw did not go through the basket. But the video shows that the next six balls went in in the last minute of the game. It was the most thrilling thing. And if that coach hadn't let go of, you know, his team being a certain, it was really, really a lesson in what you're talking about. So I just wanted to share that. You know, thank you. Thank you, Diana. And, and I agree. This coach obviously sounds like he knows what's really important about uh, uh, teamwork and teams and the difference between winning and, and, um, and really in, enjoying and nurturing his players. Well, I, I, I will go ahead with the other question unless oh, sure. somebody wants the microphone. Um, I, I see from what you're saying, and it's valuable to me, that I stop myself because of my own expectations. And through the inside edge, all of us have seen people come through here who were members and ended up writing bestsellers. I mean, we have this kind of grandiose idea of what success means and how we, how we expect to look in the world with our talents. Yes. I mean, Jack Canfield, you know, Mark Victor, all these people were kind of born at the inside edge. And, and so I find that if I'm starting something, it has to, I have this idea that it has to be really kind of amazing, whatever it is. And then I get discouraged. You know, I, I, do you have this? Does everybody have this feeling? And so, what, so if you could give us some baby steps about Sure. Uh, I mean, at least what... That's grandiose what, expectations. Okay, well, that, that, that's, a, that's an excellent question. Well, my, my take on, on it, hear, hearing what you're expressing, and I, and I know I relate to myself, is what's behind, behind these high expectations. And I think most of the time it's fear again. It's fear, it's the fear, what, what if I don't do it this way? Or what if I don't do it as, as, as good as, as, as I think I should? And that's why I use the worst case scenario is, is start, ask yourself some what ifs and then try to answer some of those what ifs. And, you, you, and I think you will find many times where, wherever you, you end up, again, is, is not so bad of a, of a place. You know, I, I like to tell the story about Johnny who comes home um, um, in, in middle school in, in, with a C plus on a, on a final exam, and what his mother is, you know, no, no f parental fears are probably the worst and the most difficult kind of fears. So with, as a parent, what do we do? It's like, uh, I had expectations of Johnny getting into uh, USC or UCLA, you know. So if he got a C plus, man, he may not even get into good high school, right? And well, if he doesn't get into good high school, then how's he going to get into good college, you know? And so I go down this path with these expectations. But then, what I would then ask and ask everybody is, how many people do you know that are successful and content that don't have college educations? I know half a dozen at least. So, again, it is the, it is, it's, I feel it's, it's fear, fear, basically fear-driven. And so the more that we can ask ourselves, well, how important is it? Is, you know, how important is it? And most of the time when we ask those questions, it's not as important as we think it might be. Yes? I can hear you. <laughs> uh, one of the areas in which control shows up a lot is in relationships. And so I haven't heard you really address that in personal relationship, husband, wife, significant other in that. And just would like you to discuss that a little bit on how you manage that. Well, again, I think with relationships, it, it, it comes down to accepting our mates more for how they are, okay? And it, it, it comes into... Okay, if, if there are things about your mate that, that bother you, if you're constantly going to be harping at them or letting them know or telling them how they should live their lives, um, what, what, what happens, what I have found that happens is it, it breeds resentment. And again, it gets into that lack, lack of intimacy. And I know, that, you know, that's a really 
difficult thing, you know. Now, obviously, if it's so bad, then we have other, you know, other options and alternatives. But what I would suggest is if you can then, again, as I said maybe earlier, think about, well, what is it that maybe I can do within that relationship on my part that might improve it, you know? Or am I, maybe I might ask myself, am I playing any role or am I responsible in any way for what this friction or turmoil, whatever it is that develops. And what I have found, and you can ask Saguta, <laughs> I may think I am so right about something and that she's so wrong about something and that it's all her fault and whatever it might be. And, you know, at the time, I really believed that. But now what I try to do is within a day, at least within 24 hours, I will ask myself, did I have any role in it? Did, did I have any, in, any, any part in it? I tell that story in, in the book about we're driving. She, Scooter likes to drive, and we're going to Pasadena for soccer, and she always takes the wrong exit, and we always get there 10, 15 minutes late. And I'm sitting there not saying any word, and then she says, well, it's your fault. And I said, well, I said, it's not. How could it be my fault? I'm not driving. You're the one doing this all the time, right? I'm right. She's totally wrong. And then she said something, and it was so true. I, you're sitting there, and it's just coming from you. You can just so worry that I'm going to miss the next exit that I do, you know. <laughs> and, and that's true. As soon as she said that, I said, yeah, I'm, I'm sitting there. Is she going to get the right exit or not, you know. And so, again, we are, we are responsible for part of it at least. And the more that we can acknowledge that and then focus on that. See, that's something we can control. Those are things that we control, but, but trying to stop her, prevent her from taking wrong exits, I'm not going to really realistically be able to do that. Can I elaborate on that question a little bit? <laughs> What's that? Can I elaborate on that question? Sure. In the male-female relationship, typically, historically, the man has taken the role of being in control, that that was considered more of a masculine yes. characteristic. And... So how would you speak to men today, particularly those that feel out of control because of finances and their world falling apart and their power position and all of that? And how would you recommend the women in their lives deal with that also? Getting some good questions. <laughs> okay, I'm going to... Um, what is your name again? I'm sorry. Christy. Christy, okay. What, what I'm going to suggest again, I'm just, it, it just fits them within the theme, is being able to accept life as it is, okay? So we're in an economy that's doing poorly, and, and many businesses are, are really hurting and, and suffering. Well, we're not really going to be able to change that, that dynamic realistically. And the more we fret about that, the, the, the more uh, personal turmoil we're going to feel and conflict we're going to feel. However, if we then change the focus again is to what may, can we do within that context? Okay. It may not be a lot, but there's some things maybe we can do. For example, if, if someone's unemployed and having trouble getting a job, they, one thing they can do is maybe take some classes, re-educate, extend what they know, right? More training that may open broader horizons for them in the job market. Uh, an obvious one is, is reducing expenses. You know, we can start eating at home more often. We can reduce our expenses. You know, uh, we can maybe try to bond more as a family within this environment, this difficult environment. So we can start looking at the things, that maybe positive things that might evolve from it. Now, that may not be the total solution, but what I guess it is, what it will do is reduce the severity of the problem. Okay, closing, just a couple. I, I, I would like to issue you some challenges for the next week. Okay? <laughs> With your mates, I want you to stop telling them what to do, stop advising them, actually listen to them, focus on what maybe you can do, on your reactions to what they're doing, ways that you can change yourself. Okay? With your children, listen attentively without advising. Our children come from us, but they're, but, they're, but they're not us. They are different from us. Honor them. Acknowledge their differences. 
allow them to, if necessary, suffer the consequences of their mistakes. Okay? In your artistic endeavors, as I already mentioned, appreciate the beauty of what you're creating and don't worry about how it's going to end up. Don't overanalyze it and don't overthink it and just let it go. Try those things this next week and then come back to the last question on the back cover of the book is what would your life be like if you simply let go of control? Thank you. It was a pleasure being here this morning. Thank you.